from Denver, Colorado. It's the Cube covering Supercomputing 17. Brought to you by Intel. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in Denver, Colorado at the Supercomputing com uh, Conference 2017. About 12,000 people talking about really the outer edges of computing. It's pretty amazing. The keynote was these huge, the square kilometer array, a new vocabulary word I, I learned today. So it's pretty exciting times and uh, we're excited to have our next guest. He's Bill Jenkins. He's a product line manager for AI on FPGAs at Intel. That's Bill, right. welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Nice to meet you, nice to talk to you today. Absolutely, so you're right in the middle of this machine learning <laughs> AI storm, which we keep sure. hearing more and more about. Storm. Kind of the next generation of big data, if you will. That's right, that's right. It's uh, the most dynamic industry I've seen since the telecom industry back in the 90s. It's just uh, evolving every, every day, every month. So, so you, Intel is making some announcements, you know, using kind of this combination of, of software programming and FPGAs on the acceleration stack to get more performance out of the data center. Did I get that right? Sure, yeah, so, yeah. So, pretty exciting, the use of, of both the hardware as well as software on top of it to open up the solution stack, open right. up the ecosystem. So what, is, what are those things are you working on specifically? So, so I really build the first, the enabling technology that brings the FPGA into that Intel ecosystem where <clears throat> Intel is trying to provide that solution from top to bottom to deliver AI products right. into that market. Um, FPGAs are a key piece of that because we provide um, a different way to accelerate those machine learning and AI workloads. Uh, where we can be an offload engine to a CPU, uh, we can be inline analytics to offload the system and get higher performance that way, uh, and we tie into that overall Intel ecosystem of, of tools and, and products. Right, so that's a pretty interesting piece because the real-time streaming data is, is all the rage now, right? Not yeah. in batch, you want to get it right. now, so how do you get it in, how do you get it written yep. to the database, how do you get it into the microprocessor? So that's a right. really, really important piece that's different than even, what, two years ago we really didn't hear about much real-time. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, it's, like I said, it's evolving quite a bit. Now, uh, a lot of people deal with training. It's the science behind it. The data scientists work to figure out what topologies they want to deploy and how they want to deploy them. But now people are building products around it. Right. And once they start deploying these technologies into products, they realize that uh, they don't want to compensate for limitations in hardware. They want to work around them. So this, this, a lot of this evolution that we're building is, is to try to find ways to more efficiently do that uh, compute. And, and what we call inferencing, the actual deployed uh, machine learning uh, scoring, as they will, right. uh, in a product. It's all about how quickly can I get the data out. It's not about waiting two seconds to start the processing. You know, in an autonomous driven car where someone's crossing the road, I'm not waiting two seconds right, to figure right. out it's a person. I need it right away. So I need to be able to do that with, um, with video feeds right off a disk drive from the ethernet data coming in. I want to do that directly in line so that my processor can do what it's good at and we offload that processor to get better system performance. Right, and then on the machine learning specifically, because that is all the rage, and it is learning. Yep. Right, so there is a real-time aspect to it. You talked about autonomous vehicles, but there's also a continuous learning over time. It's not necessarily right. dependent on learning immediately, right. but continuous improvement over time. So what are some of the unique challenges in machine learning, and, and what are some of the ways you guys are trying to address those? Yeah, I mean, once you've trained the network, um, people always have to go back and retrain. They say, okay, I've got a good accuracy, but I want better performance. So then they start lowering the precision, and they say, well, you know, today we're at 32-bit, maybe 16-bit, and then they start looking at int 8. But the problem is their accuracy drops, so they retrain that int 8 topology, that network, to get the performance um, benefit, but with the higher accuracy. But the flexibility of the FPGA actually allows people to take that network at 32-bit uh, with the 32-bit train weights, but deploy it in lower precision. So we can abstract away the fact that the hardware is so flexible, we can do what we call floating point, 11-bit floating point, or even 8-bit floating point. Uh, even here today at the show, we've got a binary and ternary demo showcasing the flexibility that the FPGA can provide today uh, with that building lock piece of hardware that the FPGA can be, um, and, and really provide uh, not only the topologies that people are trying to build today, but tomorrow, right. future-proofing their, their, their hardware, but then the precisions that they may want to do. So they don't have to retrain, they can get less than a 1% accuracy loss, but they can lower that precision to get all the performance benefits uh, of that, you know, data scientists work to come up with a new uh, architecture. Right, but it's interesting because there's trade-offs, right? There's, sure. no, there's no optimum solution. It's right. optimum as to what you're trying to optimize right. for. So it's really, true. the ability to change, the ability to continue to work on those learning algorithms, to be able to, to change your, your priority right. is pretty key. Yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot of times today you want this, 
So, it, you know, this has been the, the, the mantra of the FPGA for 30 plus years. Uh, you deploy it today, it works fine. Maybe you build an ASIC out of it. But what you want tomorrow is going to be different. So maybe if it's changing so rapidly, you build the ASIC because there's runway to that. But if there isn't, you may just say, I have the FPGA, I can just reprogram it to do what's the next architecture, the next methodology. Right. So it gives you that future proofing, that capability to sustain different topologies, different architectures, different precisions, to kind of keep people going with the same piece of hardware, uh, without having to say, spin up a new ASIC every right, year. Right. Which is, you know, even then it's uh, so dynamic, it's, it's probably faster than every year the right. way things are going today. So the other thing you mentioned is topography, and it's not the same topography you mentioned, but, you know, this whole idea of edge, right? Sure. So moving more and more compute and store and smarts to the edge, because yep. there's just not going to be time, you mentioned autonomous vehicles, a lot of applications to get everything oh, yeah. back up into the cloud, back into the data center. So you guys are pushing this technology not only in the data center, but progressively closer and closer to the edge. Absolutely, I mean, uh, the data center has a need. It's always going to be there, but they're getting big, right? There's The amount of data that we're trying to process every day is growing, right? I always say that the, the telecom industry started the information age. Well, the information age has done a great job of collecting a lot of data. Right. We have to process that. If you think about where, again, I'll maybe I'll allude back to autonomous vehicles, you're talking about um, thousands of gigabytes per day of data generated. Uh, smart factories, exabytes of data generated a day. What are you going to do with all that? It has to be processed. So we need that compute in the data center, but we have to start pushing it out into the edge, where I start thinking about even a show like this, I want security. So I want to do uh, real time weapons detection, right? Security prevention. I want to do smart city applications, just monitoring how traffic moves uh, through a mall so that I can control lighting and heating. Uh, all of these things at the edge, in the camera that's deployed on the street, in the camera that's deployed in a mall, right? All of that, we want to make those smarter so that we can do more compute to offload the amount of data that needs to be sent back to the data center right. as much as possible. Relevant right. data gets sent back. No shortage of demand for uh, compute store networking, no. is there? No, 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 these, these, it's, a, it's really a heterogeneous world, right? We need, we need all the different compute, we need all the different aspects of transmission of the data with 5G, we need disk space to store it, we need right. cooling to cool it. Uh, it's really becoming a heterogeneous world. All right, well, I'm going to give you the last word, so I can't believe we're in November of 2017, yeah. which is bananas. What are you working on for 2018? What are some of your priorities? If we talk a year from now, what are we going to be talking about? Yeah, so Intel, I mean, Intel's acquired a lot of companies over the past couple of years now on AI. You're seeing a lot of merging of the FPGA into that ecosystem. We've got the Nirvana, we've got Movidius, we've got uh, uh, Mobileye acquisitions, Saffron Technologies, all of these things, when the FPGA is kind of a key piece of that, because it gives you that flexibility of the hardware to extend those pieces. You're going to see a lot more stuff in the cloud, a lot more stuff with partners next year, um, and really enabling that edge to data center compute with things like binary neural networks, ternary neural networks, all the different next generation of topologies to kind of keep that, that leading edge flexibility that the FPJ can provide for people's products tomorrow. Exciting times. Yeah, All right, Bill, <laughs> Bill Jenkins, there's a lot going on in computing. If you're not getting your computer science degree, kids, uh, think about it again. I'm, <laughs> he's Bill Jenkins, I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching theCUBE from Supercomputing 2017. Thanks for watching. Thank you.